Hello maths fans, this is Tom Rocks Maths on tour in Delft in the Netherlands and in this video we're going to find a mandelball. Let's go! I've come to the sleepy university town of Delft in the Netherlands to try to find a mandelball. Determined to track one down, I decided to make my way into the city and begin my search. Hold on, let's rewind a second. What is a mandelbulb? A mandelbulb is a 3D representation of a fractal, and a fractal is an object that looks the same no matter how far you zoom in towards it. Despite being incredibly complex, fractals are surprisingly easy to generate. Take this cliff behind me. Turns out it's actually a stone, because rocks demonstrate fractal patterns. As you zoom in closer and closer on a rock, you get the same pattern appearing. Fractals appear everywhere in nature, and I really do mean everywhere. Anything which demonstrates self-similarity is a fractal. So you can think of the branches of a tree, the stems and leaves of a plant, the blood vessels growing and flowing through your body, even an endless series of Russian nesting dolls, and perhaps my favourite example, the coastline of a country. These are all fractal in nature. Fractals are routinely used to model chaotic motion. Chaos is something that's so random that it's completely unpredictable. And surprisingly, fractals do a very good job of representing this type of behaviour. Take turbulence, for example. If you have two waves on the surface of the ocean crashing into one another, they generate this chaotic pattern on the surface. If you were to repeat the same thing with what you thought were the same two waves, you would get a very different result. And this is chaos in action. Examples in nature are all well and good, but what about something a little bit more mathematical? Well, here is a line. Now let's divide our line into three equal segments, like so. And if we now remove the middle segment, so I have my one on this end, my little bit here, and I've removed the middle. And if I now fill the gap in the middle with two lines of equal length that we have removed, like so, it forms a little wedge shape. And you can imagine repeating this process on our new four lines. So each line is going to be divided up exactly as we did in the first place. And then we remove the middle line and replace it with the wedge shape. So pretending that these guys aren't here, we've created a sort of small scale fractal of the initial bump, the initial wedge that we started with. Now let's do one more just to really demonstrate exactly what's happening. And then again, if I divide up each of these lines into three equal parts, you can begin to see how things get very complicated very quickly. And this is basically creating our own miniature fractal. This is called a cock curve. Now, if we redo the exact same thing, but instead of starting with a line, we start with a triangle, it creates something called the Cox snowflake. And now, let's do the exact same process, generating a Cox curve on each of the three sides of our triangle. So remember, the first step is to divide our line into three equal components. So we do that on each of our three sides of the equilateral triangle. Then we remove the middle section and replace it with our wedge, like so. Looks like a Star of David, in fact. And now, I'm going to do the same with all of these little individual bits. We then remove the middle section and replace it with our little wedge. And you can hopefully begin to get an idea of what this would look like if I were to then repeat this on each of our lines and continue forever. This would generate a fractal, and this guy is called the Cox Snowflake. It has the very fun property that the perimeter the distance around the edge of our snowflake is going to equal infinity, whereas the area, the bit inside, is going to be finite. And you can think about this as follows. 
when we start with our original triangle, each side has length one, shall we say. So we have unit length. Then when we replace one of our segments by an extra two, we're actually then getting four thirds or four over three of the length that we started with. So every time we repeat the fractal generating process, we add in a factor of four thirds. So doing this n times gives us a perimeter of four thirds to the power n. And now as n gets larger and larger and larger, this number will get larger and larger because four thirds is bigger than one. And any number larger than one taken to a larger and larger power becomes bigger and bigger. So this is going to tend to infinity as n goes to infinity. And this is the perimeter. Now the area inside our triangle, we have some starting value. Let's call it a for our initial first triangle. And then as we add on each little bit, we are increasing the area. But the point is that the bits we add are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And they actually get small enough, quickly enough, as it were, to give us a finite area. So the total area as we let n go to infinity is equal to 8 fifths times our original area of our triangle. Back in Delft, I was struggling to find any mandel bulbs and the pressure was really starting to get to me. I'd searched high and low, but still no sign of any mandel bulbs. Where are the mandel bulbs? Back to mandel bulbs. I mentioned at the beginning that a mandel bulb is a 3D representation of a 2D fractal. And that particular fractal is the Mandelbrot set. So just like we devised a particular method and a set of instructions to devise our cock curve, we can do the same to derive the Mandelbrot set. And this is how it works. We start off by picking a complex number C, where C is just equal to any complex number, which is A plus B times I, where I is the square root of minus one. So we can represent C perhaps as a two dimensional vector, A. Now we have our number C. What we do is our first iteration of our Mandelbrot set is to say that Z1 equals C. Then to get the next number in our list, in our set, we define Z2 to be C squared plus C. And then for Z3, what we do is we take Z2 and we square it. So that's c squared plus c squared, and then we add c. So you'll hopefully notice that we started with c, we then squared it and added c, and then took our answer from step two and squared it and added c. And if we continued in this way, we would generate a list where the k plus first entry is equal to zk squared plus c. In other words, take the entry that we have square it and add C and we get the next number. For different values of C, this will give a list of numbers. And if we remember that our number C is actually represented as a point in our two dimensional plane, then each list will represent a different number of points in the entire plane. And now depending on which C we started with, we will either go to infinity as the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger, which is called diverging or a divergent sequence of numbers, or which is what we actually want here, we're going to get a repeating pattern of numbers which will not go to infinity. The Mandelbrot set is actually a 2D representation of these points C which do not go to infinity using this method. Mandelbrot sets are incredibly beautiful. If you continue to zoom in on the image, you go through a series of different views until you eventually return to where you started. This is the inherent behavior of a fractal. Mandelbrot sets are of course very different to the Cox snowflake which we looked at before. And that begs the question, how do you compare different fractals? 
One way to do that is using the Hausdorff dimension. We are used to thinking of dimensions as whole numbers. So for example, a line is a one-dimensional object. A plane would be two-dimensional, and something like a cube or a sphere would be three-dimensional. But what happens if we allow our dimensions to have a number between one and two, or a number between two and three? What does that even mean? This is exactly what the Hausdorff dimension is. It's a measure of how well your object fills the space in which it is contained. So in our instance with the Mandelbrot set, we want to measure how well does our fractal fill the two-dimensional plane. If we take a simple example of a half plane, where we say we have our y and our x axes, and we say that x must be greater than zero, then the half plane has a Hausdorff dimension of 1.5, because it fills exactly half of the space. If we consider some examples using particular values for the Mandelbrot set, we get different values of d. So for example, when c is equal to minus 1, we get a d value of 1.27. It fills around a quarter of our plane. And if we let c equal 1 quarter, then we get a d value of 1.08. So whilst these are both Mandelbrot sets, they have a different shape and therefore a different Hausdorff dimension d. The more space filled by your fractal, the closer its value of d will be to the number 2. A nice example is the Sapinski carpet. We begin with a square. And if the entire square is filled, then we have a value of d equals 2. It fills all of the space. However, of course, with a fractal, we are not going to fill all of our space. What we are going to do is divide our square into nine equal smaller squares. And then we're going to remove the central square from our remaining grid. Next, we repeat this process on each of the eight squares remaining. So we divide up into a grid of nine squares, and then we remove the central square from each of the smaller eight squares. And then, of course, we repeat the process. So we divide up each square into another small nine, removing the central one. So I will just demonstrate for this upper left-hand corner square, but the same thing will have to be done across the entire shape to leave us with the Sapinski carpet. The Hausdorff dimension for a Sapinski carpet has d equal to 1.89. So as you can see from these images, it fills most of the space, around 90% of it, but not quite the entire two-dimensional space. Back in Delft, I'd been going so crazy trying to find a mandel bulb that I enlisted the help of my good friend Joe. Joe usually has a knack for these kinds of things, and he told me that I'd be better off trying to model a mandel bulb instead of trying to find one. To do this, we decided to take some inspiration from a real-world fractal. Let's return to coastlines. Imagine you have to measure the length of the UK coastline and the only tool you have is a one meter ruler. You would walk around the country and you would make your measurement. You would get some value, let's call it L1. Now if you went back and used a smaller ruler, let's say a 30 centimeter ruler, you would get a different value for the length of the coastline. You would in fact get a larger value, let's call it L2, where L2 is bigger than L1. And that's because by using the 30 centimeter ruler, you are able to more accurately measure the jagged or fractal nature of the coastline. Formalizing this mathematically, we have that the length L is equal to E times N, where E is the length of your measuring instrument and N is the number of instruments needed to cover the whole length. So with the one meter ruler, even though E is larger, the number of measurements we make, N will be much smaller. And for the 30 centimeter ruler, E, of course, will be smaller, but N will be much larger. And N is much larger in such a way that our final value of the length is slightly bigger. In fact, we have a formula for any fractal curve which connects the number of measuring sticks N, the length E, and the fractal dimension D. The formula says that N is proportional to 1 divided by E to the power D.
Multiplying both sides of the equation by e, we then get that the length, which is e times n, is proportional to 1 divided by e to the power of d minus 1. The key is that the UK coastline does not have a dimension of d equal to 1 because it's not a straight line. The actual value is d equals 1.26. And what this means in our formula is that we have a number e, which is to a positive power on our denominator because d minus 1 is greater than 0. And so as e becomes smaller and smaller, we are dividing by a number which gets closer and closer to 0. And this ultimately will cause the length to go to infinity. Of course, the UK coastline is not actually infinite in length. If you start at one point on the coast and walk around the entire country, you do get back to where you started, which is why this is called the coastline paradox. Since we are talking about dimensions, I have to mention space filling curves. These are very similar to fractals in the sense that you follow a set of instructions to draw your shape. But with a space filling curve, it will actually fill the entire space within which it is contained. So in the plane, a 2D space filling curve will draw a perfect line which fills every single point in that plane if allowed to continue forever. These were discovered in 1890 by Italian mathematician Pino, and they have Hausdorff dimension equal to 2 because they fill the entire plane. I'd say we're just about ready now to think about building a mandelbulb. So remember, a mandelbulb is a 3D rendering of the two-dimensional fractal, the Mandelbrot set. In general, it's quite difficult to build a three-dimensional fractal. So let's start with a more familiar example. Taking our Sapinski carpet, which we worked on earlier, we can create a 3D version of this, which is called a Menger sponge. Before, we divided up our square into nine equal squares and then removed the middle one. So let's follow the same pattern. Take our cube, divide it up into 27 smaller cubes, so that's nine divisions on each face like before, and then again, as before, we're going to remove the central cube. But not only the central cube, we also remove the six which are attached to each of its faces. You can imagine removing a three-dimensional plus sign from the center of our cube. This is the first step towards creating the Menger sponge. We then repeat this same process on the remaining 20 cubes exactly as before, and we generate our three-dimensional fractal, the Menger sponge. In this case, we have a Hausdorff dimension d equal to 2.72. That's one way to generate a three-dimensional fractal. But how do we do this for the Mandelbrot set? First, we need to think about how did we generate the Mandelbrot set in two dimensions in the first place. We started with a formula, zk plus 1 equals zk squared plus c. And here, z is a complex number. Now, you can think of a complex number, z equals a plus i times b, as a two vector. If you put the real number as the first component of your vector and the imaginary part of the number as the second component, you have a vector a, b. When we multiply complex numbers together, we know how to do this. We do a plus i, b times itself, a plus i, b, gives us a squared minus b squared plus 2ab i. And writing this as a two vector, we get a squared minus b squared in position one and 2ab in position two. Now, the problem is, if we were to generalize this to three dimensions, we don't really have a three-dimensional analog of complex numbers. There is no well-defined way to do multiplication for three vectors. Perhaps surprisingly, we can actually do this in four dimensions and create a perfect, true four-dimensional Mandelbrot set. But of course, unfortunately, we can't show you a four-dimensional object. We live in a three-dimensional world. The best we can do in 3D is to create the three-dimensional rendering of the Mandelbrot set. It is not a true Mandelbrot. To create our Mandelbulbs then, we just need to define three vector multiplication. And we do this using the white Nylander formula. The trick is to think about what's happening geometrically when we multiply together two complex numbers. If you've ever experimented with an Argand diagram, if you have a complex number and you multiply it by another complex number, ultimately, 
there's a stretch and a rotation. The modulus or the distance of your point from the origin will either increase or decrease. And the argument, the angle from the positive x-axis, will again either increase or decrease. So there's a stretch, a shift in the distance from the origin, and a rotation, a change in your argument. For a typical complex number, z equals a plus b i, it has a modulus equal to a squared plus b squared, an argument equal to arctan of b over a. When we square the number, we now have modulus equal to a squared minus b squared all squared plus 4a squared b squared, and this simplifies to be equal to a squared plus b squared squared, which is exactly the square of the original modulus. And the argument of z squared is twice the original argument. Working in exponential form, we can write z as r e to the i theta. which means that when we now take z squared, we get r squared e to the 2i theta. And it's quite clear from this particular expression that the modulus has become squared and the argument is twice that of the original theta. If we generalize this to any power n, we get a very similar result. We have the modulus to the power n and then we have n times our argument. What the white nylander formula does is generalize this concept to three dimensions. So taking a three vector to some power n just means taking its length to the power n and multiplying its angle by the number n. Since we are now working in three dimensions, the analog to the r theta definition of a complex number via plane polar coordinates is to use spherical polar coordinates. This means that for a three vector r theta phi taken to the power n, we get r to the power n, n times theta, and n times phi. So taking these new values for the radius and our two angles and plugging them into our spherical polar coordinates will give us a new point in spherical coordinates. Using this as our definition of multiplication of a three vector, we can now use the original Mandelbrot formula to generate our Mandelbulbs. The first Mandelbulb looks very much like the Mandelbrot set, and that's because we've taken the exact same formula, z squared plus c, where remembering that the multiplication is defined via our three-dimensional extension of multiplication of complex numbers. But we can do things more generally, because we didn't just define multiplication for powers of two, we actually defined it for powers of n. So if we consider the more general formula, z of k plus 1 equals zk to the power n plus c, we can actually put in different values of n and generate different Mandelbulbs. So for n equals 2, we have the 3D rendering of the actual Mandelbrot set, and then as we increase n, we get different Mandelbulbs. n equals 8 is perhaps the most famous, which is the one that you may have seen before. The Mandelbulb for n equals 8 is in fact the one used in the film Annihilation. I came to Delft to find a Mandelbulb. Unfortunately, I failed. But as you can see by these fantastic shapes behind me, I have ended up building my very own Mandelbulb instead. Before I go, I'll leave you all with a question. We've looked at Mandelbulbs for different values of n, but what's going to happen as n gets larger and larger? What happens when n tends to infinity? Send your answers in to at Tom Rocks Maths on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. 
You can also get in touch on my website, tomrocksmaths.com. And remember, if you've enjoyed watching this video, please do subscribe to my channel. Of all the correct entries, we will draw one name out of a hat and send you a signed Mandelbulb print. Thank you very much for watching, and thank you to Joe and Jamie for producing the video.